Welcome in here to our chapter 7 material on ionic equilibria. In our last video, we looked at the solubility of ionic compounds. Now we're going to shift gears and start to think about both complex ions and multiple equilibria at the same time. All right, we'd like to go back to our ideas on coordination chemistry. Now thinking about it in the context of equilibrium. So let's rewind. Coordination compounds form between metal centers and ligands that bond to that metal. We have some Lewis acid base chemistry, and we end up with nice coordination complexes, usually octahedral, tetrahedral, or square planar geometry. If we want to think about this process in terms of equilibrium, we can describe our metal and our ligands forming this complex. This reaction can be described with an equilibrium constant, and we'll give it a special name. We'll call this Kf, or formation, the formation of a complex. We can look at an example. This is just like all of our other equilibrium constants. And so if we have this reaction, we can write our equilibrium constant like this the products divided by the reactants. This might get a little bit messy where we have square brackets for our complex and square brackets for molarity, but we can try to keep track. And of course, don't forget our coefficients turn into exponents. Since this is the formation of a complex, we call this Kf as a special name. We've written out the equation. Now we can look at some values. Here are some Kf values for some fairly common metal and ligand combinations. Notice that our KFs are enormous. These are complexes that really like to form, and so our equilibrium constant is going to be very, very large. We can also think about complex ion formation as kind of a common ion effect coupled with our solubility reactions. If we have a precipitate, but we also have some ligands present, we can try to do both reactions at the same time. When this happens, we'll form some of our complex, which will cause more of our solid to dissolve. Right? If we can do both of these reactions, they can be tied together by that common reactant and product. In our example here, it's silver plus. These two reactions get to be tied together based on that silver plus. If we have just a little bit of our silver chloride dissolving, because the KSP is very small, but then we add some ligand to our solution, we're able to remove some of that product from our dissolving reaction. Well, Chatelier's principle says, in order to counteract that, we'll have to do more of this forward reaction up top. Alternatively, we can do kind of a two-step mechanism where we combine these two reactions. If we add these reactions together, we end up with this reaction down below. Silver chloride in the presence of cyanide makes our silver complex and some chloride ions. The equilibrium constant for this overall process has to be the product of our two equilibrium constants for our individual steps. Notice here, we can actually get a value. The equilibrium constant for dissolving in the presence of a ligand is going to be, well, approximately 10 to the positive 11th power. This is a very big number. Our silver chloride, which is not soluble in water, is going to be quite soluble if there's a large amount of cyanide present. This is a common theme that we can see. In the presence of ligands, we can have our insoluble precipitates become much, much, much more soluble. We can visualize this. Here is a beaker of silver chloride. It is mostly insoluble, right? We have this crystal solid sitting at the bottom of our beaker. When there is ammonia added to that beaker, now instead of remaining as a solid, we can form that complex that diamine silver one complex, which is soluble. 
those two equilibria can combine together, we end up with something that is much, much more soluble. And our silver chloride, which we think of as insoluble, can be dissolved under the right circumstances when there's also another reaction we can do with our ligands. If we'd like, we can reframe this process to be not the formation of a complex, but a complex dissociating into its metal and ligands. This is the opposite process, right? The reverse reaction of our Kf. And so we can have our equilibrium constant for this reverse reaction be the inverse of the equilibrium constant for the forward process. We call this dissolution or dissociation. This is Kd. Once again, just giving this equilibrium constant a special name, a complex breaking apart into its individual pieces. Sometimes it's nice to do this so that we have an equilibrium constant that is very, very small, and it's more intuitive to know when to use that small x approximation. As an example, here we have a practice problem. If we want to try this as it's written, our ice table can be set up like this. We have our Kf value is equal to this expression. This is one equation with one unknown. But notice here, our Kf is going to be quite large. And so our x is actually not going to be very small at all. Our x is going to be very close to the limiting reactant. So solving this without the small x approximation, this is going to be hard to do. Instead, we can use some of our previous strategies. Can we set up maybe a two-step process? First, we can do stoichiometry. What is our limiting reactant? Go all the way 100% towards completion. And then we can inch off and go back and do an equilibrium step after that. It looks like copper will be our limiting reactant. So let's use up all of that copper first, and then we'll try to do equilibrium. What we get for our Kf expression is now this, where we have mostly products and zero of one of our reactants, and we're going to form those reactants just a little bit more. Notably, our Kf is extremely large, so we're not going to form many of these reactants back again our x in this equation is going to be very small, which is great because it makes this complicated equation much easier to solve. Once we have our answer for x, we can go back and check if this was a good assumption, and it seems like it is. x compared to the things we're adding or subtracting it from is many, many orders of magnitude smaller. All right, our last topic here we can think about coupled equilibria. We've already actually thought about this a little bit before in terms of Le Chatelier's principle and thinking about multiple chemical reactions at the same time, but now we can introduce it formally. When we have multiple reactions that share one of their chemicals, they can be essentially tied together. They can be considered coupled equilibria. Anytime one of those systems is disturbed, it will disturb the rest of the systems that are coupled with it. All of these equilibrium positions affect each other. This makes our real life situations much, much more complicated than we might initially expect. And we can see that in our example right here. There's a complicated system of carbon dioxide reacting with water to form carbonic acid, which can then dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate, which then dissociates into carbonate and more hydrogen ions, which then influences the solubility of calcium carbonate. The solubility of calcium carbonate is actually really important for many, many ocean creatures, including coral. Coral build their structures out of calcium carbonate, and it needs to be insoluble for these structures to actually exist. The amount of acid in the water will affect how much carbonate is around. In the presence of acid, this carbonate will be removed from our system. 
if we do this reaction, removing our carbonate from the system, forming bicarbonate, we're going to have to replace that in our reaction number four. Essentially, what we've seen before, calcium carbonate is more soluble in the presence of acid because of these coupled equilibria. If we'd like, we can also combine some reactions together. And if we want the equilibrium constant here, we can say that this is going to be the product of our reaction four, reaction three, and we can try to calculate this numerically as well. So once again, with our equilibrium type problems, conceptually, we can think about Le Chatelier's principle, one equilibrium affecting another. Quantitatively, maybe we can combine multiple reactions together and determine the overall equilibrium constant for that total process. We have a couple more examples of these coupled equilibria. Not always the most fun examples, but you know, important to think about. In our teeth, we like to have our tooth enamel coating our teeth, protecting them from the outside environment. And as it turns out, this tooth enamel is composed of this compound. Notably, this compound contains basic anions, which means it's going to be much, much more soluble in the presence of acid. Here's the dissolving reaction. We could describe this with KSP. We also have the possibility for hydroxide that's formed to react with H+. This is the inverse of KW. Lastly, we can have our other basic anions react with acid. This is our neutralization reaction for phosphate which we can describe as the reverse of our Ka process for that HPO4 2 minus. These three reactions are obviously tied together. We can see that when there's acid present, we will very readily do this first neutralization reaction, which will remove our hydroxide, which will cause more of our solid to dissolve compounds with basic anions are going to be much, much more soluble in the presence of acid, especially in the case of hydroxide as this ion, because hydroxide is such a strong base, it will react very readily with any acid that is around. What we can do to counteract this, we don't want our teeth to have their enamel dissolving all the time when we eat acidic food or whatnot. What we can do is have fluoride in our drinking water, fluoride in our toothpaste to help replace the hydroxide in this tooth enamel mineral. Fluoride is still a base, but it's going to be a much weaker base, and that reaction is going to not happen nearly as readily, and our tooth enamel won't be nearly as soluble even in the presence of acid. There still is a problem here. We don't want to have acid in our mouth all the time, uh, which is how we get cavities. Actually, the bacteria that live out there in our mouth digest any extra food that's around, producing some acidic byproducts. If you don't brush your teeth, that's why you get the cavity. All right, one last example here. You can also think about the pH of our blood. We do want to have our pH regulated within our body. We can't have it going too high or too low. Both of those are going to be a problem for us. We want it to be between about 6.8 and about 7.8 as the pH. The way our bodies do this is by using a buffer system. The buffer system is going to involve bicarbonate, carbonic acid, and carbon dioxide. The bicarbonate our blood reacts, forms carbonic acid, which can decompose and forming some CO2. Notably, the pKa for our uh, carbonic acid is 6.1 at body temperature, which means this is going to be a hard buffer system to maintain. It's actually going to be outside of that ideal buffer range. So we can do a few things. We can have our kidneys slowly maintaining the pH by regulating the amounts of these chemicals. We can also have our lungs quickly regulate our pH by removing CO2 as we exhale. 
when we exhale that CO2, we're going to need to form some more of it. We can do this forward reaction, which will shift our buffer system uh, all the way towards the right. We can try one numerical question here. If we want to know the molar solubility of TLOH3 in the presence of 0.1 molar ammonia, as opposed to pure water, well, we can think about these two equilibrium processes happening in tandem. Here is our dissolving process described by KSP. Notably, KSP is extremely small. This compound will be very much insoluble. Here is our process described by KF, the formation of this hexaamine complex. Notably, our KF is pretty large, 10 to the positive 10, which means we expect to see a lot of this complex. If we're trying to do both these processes at once, we can add these reactions together and end up with an overall process. The equilibrium constant for this process will be the product of our individual equilibrium constants. We're now free to do our ice table calculation. The solubility is if we have lots of our solid, and in this case, 0.1 molar ammonia, none of our other chemicals, how much of this will dissolve? What's nice here is that our KSP value was very, very small to begin with, even though our thing will be more soluble in the presence of this ligand, it will still be not soluble enough that we uh, have to worry about our X being big. Our K here is still 10 to the negative 36th power, which means our X for this ice table is going to be very small. What we end up with, our solubility, 2.2 times 10 to the negative 11 molar. One final problem here. If we have complex ions forming in our solutions, well, maybe there are multiple ligands that are present. That will actually be the case very often because water itself can act as a ligand. Here's an example where silver can form a complex with water as a ligand, or if there's ammonia around, silver can form a complex with ammonia instead. This aqua complex or this amine complex. If we want to think about these two equilibria together, we can do that conceptually with Le Chatelier's principle, or we can do that numerically by adding these reactions together, forming a new overall process where one complex is in equilibrium with the other complex. The equilibrium constant for this overall process, well, what did we do? For that first reaction, it looks like we had to flip it. The second reaction, we left the same. So our K here will be the equilibrium constant for that first process inverted times our K for our second process not inverted. Essentially, this is going to be the ratio of our equilibrium constants for that amine complex compared to our aqua complex. Whichever complex has the larger KF value, well, more of that complex will form and will favor that complex. We can think back, maybe we did something like this in our experiment this semester. What value did you get for the equilibrium constant that we measured? What does that tell us about the relative equilibrium formation constants for those two different complexes we studied? All right, that will wrap us up for this video. We have looked at our complex ion formation process, also some dissociation, and then how to deal with multiple equilibria all at the same time, whether that is conceptually or quantitatively. Thank you for being here. Please let me know if you have any questions. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.